behind me here is a whole lot of white and it's not the good kind. It is powdery mildew. Now, powdery mildew causes commercial growers millions of dollars a year and they go to great lengths to ensure that it's not an issue in their production. So today's video, we're going to take science, look at what commercial growers do and what we can do on a small scale backyard scenario to make it so that your squash plants do not look like they're helping smuggle cocaine for the cartel. Now, if you don't know who I am, my name is Ashley. I have a bachelor's of science in soil science. I've been working in the agricultural world for about 15 years, and I like to take said science and apply it to the garden in a fun, relaxed manner with a lot of comedic relief, mostly because I can't take myself seriously. So this here is powdery mildew. And I don't know if you knew this, but there's over a thousand different species of powdery mildew, each one having its preferred host. So in this case, the host is zucchini and also is why none of the other squash have powdery mildew this bad, except for the zucchini. Now, the fun part about powdery mildew is that they don't necessarily need moisture or high heat like other forms of fungal issues do. They will get along just fine on a bone dry leaf in the heat of the summer, shockingly enough. So not watering your leaves isn't going to help you in many cases. To make matters worse, it actually can and will overwinter in the soil, in your mulch, and in your plant debris, and ultimately then your compost if you choose to compost said infected leaves. Now, professional growers, number one thing they do is a heck of a lot of pruning, which is something obviously you can do as well. Step one is going to be removing the infected leaves, obviously, and then we want to remove in hopes of getting more airflow. So this can come down to proper plant spacing in the beginning, and then it obviously can evolve into proper pruning of leaves. Staking can also help, and there are ways to actually stake or trellis zucchinis, oddly enough. I did not do that. I never do anything highly productive in my garden. It just survival of the fittest, survival of the fittest in my life, friends, family, and plants. The only thing I have a little bit of remorse and love for are animals. Commercial growers, number one thing they do is actually look at the leaves itself every single day. They look at the top and they look at the bottom to try to see if they can see any sort of powdery mildew. Now, fun fact here is that if you have a mild summer, your powdery mildew is going to be worse. So for me personally, it's been incredibly cold in Saskatoon and I have probably the worst powdery mildew I have ever had on my zucchinis. And the reason for that is because heat actually will slow the spores down, which can delay them in some cases long enough to get a harvest off of your plants. So this can be possible if you have a greenhouse, for example, and you can put the sides of the greenhouse down to allow things to warm up. You could remove shade cloth if it exists. More heat, the better, because it's going to not eliminate, but it will slow this whole thing down. Now, this one is actually kind of odd. <laughs> there was a little bit of experimentation done and it showed that roses that had powdery mildew on them when exposed to light for 24 hours actually reduced powdery mildew by 62%. Now, I'm sure your neighbors are not gonna appreciate you having grow lights on in the middle of your yard in the middle of the night non-stop but it's cool to note that it's possible now before we get into the tried and true of how to prevent this powdery mildew let's talk about how it actually overwinters in your garden okay yes you heard me right powdery mildew does not die in the winter it spends the entire winter plotting its revenge on you and it does it via overwintering and plant debris along with the mulch. Now, here's the thing. There are some solutions to this. Number one solution is either A, not composting the leaves or only composting them in the event you are very confident in your ability to do hot compost. That is the key, very important. If you're not confident that your, comp your compost is getting hot, it will overwinter. Now this is debated because that's what science does and that is what we need it for, despite the fact that it can get nasty sometimes. It's definitely something you may wanna keep on your radar. Now number two is actually solarization. So I've done entire videos on solarization, so I'm not gonna to touch on what that is, but you can either do that here 
when you go to actually rip everything off the garden, or you can do it in the spring, or you can lay the poly now, let the snow land on it, and then it's ready for the spring before you have to go outside in the cold. The obvious one is going to be powdery mildew resistant plants. There are several varieties out there that claim to be able to do this. Definitely something you may want to consider looking into if it is relatively severe. Resistant uh, does not mean foolproof. You can and will still get some powdery mildew. So it's something that you still want to manage. Now, for the mulch, the mulch that is on top of any bed that is near a powdery mildew outbreak, well, the spores are overwintering on it and it's overwintering obviously on the surface of the soil or the mulch, depending on what the scenario is. Now, what we can do is we can actually put more mulch on top if we wanted to, obviously compost, hot compost, the mulch that exists. But if we put more mulch on top, we can do two to three inches and this will bury the actual spores. And it has been shown that it does reduce the potential infections because not as much debris or spore is actually kicked up when wind moves across it or when you disturb it, when you weed or when rain hits the ground. So that is definitely something to consider. If you don't want to remove the mulch, just add more to the top. And mulch is much, much, much different than compost or manure. You can't really have too much mulch, if that makes sense. So definitely something you should look at. Now, in the world of commercial growers, they have something called UVC lamps, and they also use biofungicides. Now, obviously, you don't have access to a massive light bar that's well over a thousand dollars. So that's not an option for you as a gardener, or maybe it is, but in this economy, I doubt it, particularly if you're in Canada. So number one is actually potassium bicarbonate. So yes, sodium bicarbonate is baking soda, but this is baking soda on steroids to say the least. And it has been shown to reduce infections by 60%. Yes, that's a lot. If I forget to put some links down below, please remind me and I will link a potassium bicarbonate that works for something like this. Okay, number two is sulfur. Now you guys have heard me talk about sulfur endlessly. It's because it is the OG fungicide in the world of gardening, horticulture, you name it. And it's because it works fantastically. Now it smells like rotten eggs given, but there are two different options here. You can have a sulfur burner, which is actually what we have used in research greenhouses, or you can get a powder with a powder pump, which is what I use here in my garden. And I actually haven't had powdery mildew for a very long time, like two, three years, if you look back on my channel. Um, obviously I have it this year. So I'm assuming I brought it in somehow on a mulch or compost or something. And then I didn't treat it because I didn't really spend a whole lot of time outside because it's been cold and now we have this. But fungicide, or, but sulfur, I promise you, is fantastic for something like this. Okay, next up is actually milk. You guys have heard me speak about this a lot, and I have a whole video on it, and it's because it does work. There's a number of different reasons for why it works, so go check out the video if you want more information. But the ratio is 1 to 10, so 1 part milk to 10 parts water, a.k.a one cup of milk to 10 cups of water, and then you simply spray it on the surface of the mulch and then the leaves obviously as well. This you would want to spray, you could spray it during an active infection. If your leaves look like that, you wanna get rid of as many as possible, but you can spray it on an active infection the two above this, you could also spray, spray an active uh, infection. And then you can actually preventatively use all three of these as well because it's completely harmless in the sense that if you don't have an infection, it's really not doing anything bad. These two are, they're on the list, but for me personally, I'm kind of eh as to whether or not they work. For some people they do. For me personally, I find that they don't, given I'm incredibly inconsistent when it comes to using <laughs> any sort of treatment. And that is uh, neem. Neem oil is number one. Number two is actually baking soda with some soap. Uh, so that is sodium bicarbonate with some soap. The idea is that it holds the, the soap holds the baking soda onto the leaves and that helps with the process of destroying those spores. So one thing you can do next year, not so much this year, but 
the next year is actually start your seeds inside of a potting soil that is high in silicon or you can use silicon in your actual garden. And the idea here is that if we use products like that, it can actually toughen up the cell walls, which is kind of like an armor plating. And again, we've done videos on this as well, but the idea there is that even pests, spores obviously, nothing can penetrate that leaf because it has kind of like an armor plate on the outside. So here's the game plan. If you have an active infection, you're going to grab powdered sulfur milk or potassium bicarbonate and you're going to put it onto the leaves after you've removed as many heavily infected leaves as possible keep it under 30 percent of the plant however because any more than that you can actually hurt the plant and reduce its ability to produce once the season is done we are going to whack it off at the bottom and if we're confident in our ability to hot compost we are going to hot compost. If we are not comfortable in our ability to hot compost, we can put it in the compost bin and the city can deal with it, or we can put it into the garbage. Next up is if we want to really ensure we take care of things, we are going to put a poly down, polyplastic. We want it nice and close to the soil surface, rocks on top to help hold it down. And this is going to solarize it until the snow flies. And then it's gonna solarize it once the snow this is actually gone, cooking the spores away, if you will. Then when spring comes, we're going to aim for varieties that have been grown to be resistant to powdery mildew. And we're going to grow them in something such as a sunshine mix number four, which has something called resilience in it, which is silicon, silicon that the plants can uptake. Next up, we're going to transplant said plants outdoors. And then we're going to add somewhere around two to three inches of mulch on top of the mulch that we believe may still have some spore activity on it. If you follow even one or two of these, I can guarantee you will reduce the powdery mildew you have. If you follow all of them, I would be pretty shocked if it was not negated entirely. Geek Crew, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Let me know if you have powdery mildew issues and if you do, how you treat them. And I will talk to you guys next time.